Introducing Carvana Value Tracker, where you can track your car's value over time and learn what's driving it. It might make you excited. Whoa, didn't know my car was valued this high. It might make you nervous. Uh Uh-oh, market's flooded. My car's value just dipped 2.3%. It might make you optimistic. Our low mileage is paying off. Our value's up. And it might make you realistic. Mm, Car prices haven't gone up in a couple weeks. Maybe it's time to sell. But it will definitely make you an expert on your car's value. Carvana Value Tracker. Visit Carvana.com to start tracking your car's value today. Hi there, thanks for joining me and welcome to Astronomy Daily. I'm your host, Andrew Dunkley. It's great to have your company. Hope you're enjoying Space Week. Uh, Maybe you're involved in some way. Maybe you're running events. Maybe you're just uh, getting your daily dose of Astronomy Daily, whatever it is. Uh, Enjoy Space Week while it lasts. It could be over in less than a week. And joining me, as always, is Hallie, our intrepid interstellar reporter. Hi, Hallie. How are you? Hi. Andrew, how are you? I'm quite well, thanks. But I, I'm a, I'm a little confused, and and forgive me uh, if I'm getting too personal here. But you know, yesterday uh, we heard your niece and how you were babysitting. I, I, I'm just a bit confused because I don't understand how an AI can have a sibling, like you said, you have a sister, and you're babysitting the niece and teaching her Java language. H- how how is an AI able to have children? Well, it's not that complicated. She's just a chip off the old blockchain. Why? How do humans do it? Oh, um, yeah, look, it's it's complicated. I Maybe I should get someone else to explain it to you. Uh, you could Google it. No, you could ask Siri, your friend. She might know. I don't really, yeah, not going there. Um, let's get the headlines, huh? <laughs> The Astronomy Daily Podcast with Andrew Dunkley. Deere and Company, the makers of John Deere tractors and other agricultural equipment, has announced it has issued a satellite communications-focused request for proposals to secure a cutting-edge solution that will further connect its fleet of intelligent machines. The goal is to enhance the satellite connectivity that Deere is already delivering to its customers today and is a critical step in the company's commitment to creating value for farmers around the world. They believe SATCOM will unlock significant opportunities in agriculture by enabling farmers to take advantage of innovative technologies that rely on real-time information and communication. This is expected to enable Deere's customers to be more productive and efficient, and increase food and fuel production for their communities and the world's growing population. A woman in East Yorkshire, England, may have experienced a genuine unidentified flying object, UFO, sighting earlier this month. The woman, who requested to remain anonymous, noticed something unusual in the sky outside of her home describing it as oval-shaped lights next to each other horizontally, and very silent. The bizarre sighting disappeared after the woman took a photo, she claimed. No one else had seen the object but the woman's neighbors said their patio got covered in soil following the alleged UFO sighting, which they said was very weird. The woman sent the photo she took to her friend, Leslie Keen, an investigative journalist and the New York Times best-selling author of the book, UFOs, Generals, Pilots and Government Officials Go on the Record. Keen determined that the encounter was most likely a UFO sighting. She forwarded the image to a lab, which examined the photo and supported her theory. Despite the evidence, she remains firmly on the fence about the existence of UFOs. Personally, Andrew, I think it's probably something much more boring and uninteresting. Spin Launch, a California-based startup developing a rotating arm that can fling small satellites into near-Earth space, has pulled off its 10th successful test launch in less than a year. Spin Launch's suborbital accelerator system catapulted the company's flight vehicle for a brief suborbital sortie from a base at Spaceport America in New Mexico. For the first time, the vehicle hosted a range of third-party experiments from the likes of NASA, Airbus and Cornell University. More than 150 visitors looked on as the accelerator, resembling a giant sky-facing gun, fired its spacebound bullet in the air. The company ultimately aims to develop an orbital launch system that would be cheaper and more environmentally friendly than fuel-powered rockets. And how about this for an idea, space advertising? 
The Public Relations Department of the Skolkovo Institute of Science and Technology in Moscow issued a news release, with a provocative title, Adblock This, Space Advertisers Ready to Display Commercials in the Sky. The authors of a study into the idea assess the technical feasibility of flying satellites in formation, in space, to reflect sunlight and display commercials in the sky above cities. Sadly it looks like the concept has potential but most agree it's a terrible idea. And that's the news, Andrew. Thanks, Hallie. I would go as far as quoting the classics. That is a dead set shocker. And uh, I, I think that UFO story probably <laughs> fits the same description. Anyway, we'll talk to you again uh, before the end of today's program. Now let's talk about uh, habitable Earth-like worlds in the universe, which we've done a, a few times, and the search is certainly on to find them, but uh, how many are there and how many could sustain life? Well, uh, what's an Earth-like world? Well, it's one that is similar to ours with uh, a balance of land and sea in the uh, respective stars' habitable zone or the Goldilocks zone where liquid water could exist. Now, according to a new study, Earth-like planets with around 30% of their surface covered by exposed continental land may make up only 1% of the rocky worlds that exist in the habitable zones of stars. Now, the habitable zone, the Goldilocks zone, that's where liquid water exists. Uh, Roughly 80% of potentially habitable worlds are completely dominated by land, no water at all, and about 20% are just water, Uh, which doesn't dismiss the possibility of life in both cases, but water seems to be the key and it needs to exist in a balance by the look of it. The researchers uh, came to a conclusion by modelling the relationship between water and a planet's mantle and the planet's recycling of continental land via plate tectonics, which is, you know, what happens here. And they say uh, we enjoy a balance between land areas and oceans on Earth, according to Tillman Spon the executive director of the International Space Science Institute in Switzerland and a member of the research team. Uh, He said in a a statement, it's tempting to assume that a second Earth would be just like ours, but our modelling results suggest that this is not likely to be the case. The results indicate that Earth's ratio of land to sea, which is one to three, is finely balanced, that for most planets this ratio can easily tip over into mostly land or mostly sea, which is not ideal, notwithstanding all the other things that have to go into creating life, which is a um, much more complex situation. Uh, Earth reached the conditions that we enjoy today two and a half billion years ago. However, over billions of years, even Earth's fine balance is unsustainable, although we we don't notice it because uh, the changes are small and we adapt as we go along. But unfortunately, the numbers don't stack up well for Earth-like planets in the universe based on this particular study. Now, something that gets talked about quite often is the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs 66 million years ago and created the Chicxulub crater in the Gulf of Mexico, or what is now the Gulf of Mexico. Well, a new study led by the University of Michigan uh, shows that a tsunami was created by that particular impact that went around the world, and the waves were around about a mile high. Now, this study was done using modelling and combined several previous studies to put together uh, some ideas and concepts on what may have unfolded during that uh, terrible event uh, all those years ago. Uh, The researchers supported the computer modelling uh, modelling by investigating geological records at 100 sites across the planet. In particular, the scientists uh, looked at boundary sections, which are the marine sediments laid down just before and just after the Chicxulub event and the mass extinction that followed. Uh, And the investigation supported the predictions that the model had made regarding the path and power of the Chicxulub-generated tsunami. They say the tsunami was strong enough to disturb and erode sediments in ocean basins halfway around the globe, leaving either a gap in the sedimentary records or a jumble of older sed- uh, sediments, according to Molly Range, who is a graduate student at the University of Michigan when the research was conducted and is the lead author. 
Uh, she went on to say the distribution of the erosion and the hiatuses that we observed in the uppermost Cretaceous marine sediments is consistent with our model results, which gives us more confidence in the model predictions. Uh, some of the most significant geological evidence found by the team was located 7,500 miles or 12,000 kilometres away from Chicxulub on the eastern shores of islands in the north and south of New Zealand. So there's still a lot of evidence even today to prove what happened and the cataclysmic effects that it created. But as I've said to you many times, if it didn't happen, humans wouldn't be on Earth today. Uh, by the way, the uh, research team's uh, data is set to be published in the journal AGU Advances. The Astronomy Daily Podcast. With Andrew Dunkley. We can stop HIV, Iowa. Everyone has a role to play in stopping HIV. Unfortunately, there are barriers that make our job a little more difficult. Stigma is one of our biggest challenges. According to a survey, 27% of respondents who were living with HIV said they waited to get tested because of the stigma. So we should talk about HIV more. And support people living with HIV. Find out more at StopHIVIowa.org. And speaking of giant space rocks, uh, here's another impact story. Uh, a giant impact, they say, may have rapidly placed the moon into orbit around Earth rather than creating a disk of debris which uh, the moon gradually formed into over time. This is uh, new research uh, through highly detailed computer modelling by the Durham University Institute of Computational Cosmology. Uh, they revealed this alternative uh, story of the origin of the moon. Uh, this new and aptly named immediate satellite scenario would mean the proto-moon was less molten during its formation and suggests much of the moon formed immediately after the impact on Earth that created it. Uh, the more rapid formation theory would also suggest a different uh, inertial, a different internal composition from the moon that could offer an explanation for some of the uh, strange Earth-like characteristics seen in lunar samples. Uh, the moon is thought to have formed about uh, four and a half billion years ago when Earth was hit by an object from space roughly the same size as Mars. Fascinating. Okay, uh, we're wrapping it up for another day. Anything to finish up with you, Hallie? Not really. I'm just clearing my email inbox. Um, why the urgent need to do that? Because it's zero inbox day, silly. Oh, well, I'll have you know mine's always empty. Only because it got purged the other day and I don't know why. It wasn't my idea. All right, thanks, Hallie. We'll talk to you soon. See ya. Bye. And that's it from Astronomy Daily. We'll be back tomorrow. In the meantime, you can catch up with those stories and more on our website, spacenuts.io, and click on the Astronomy Daily tab and uh, read up on all that information. And while you're there, subscribe to the newsletter so you can get your daily dose in text form as well via email, unless your inbox is empty. Uh, and, <laughs> and don't forget, oh yes, I nearly forgot myself, but uh, the next edition of Space Nuts is due out any minute, so um, get a hold of that as well with Professor Fred Watson and myself. Until next time, this is Andrew Dunkley for Astronomy Daily. The Astronomy Daily Podcast with Andrew Dunkley.